Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the second webinar in the series of four webinars covering the BSP development of the S3 guidelines. Uh, they were published recently and are available through the BSP website. I'm Ian Dunn, and I'm going to be your host for this evening. Before I introduce our speaker, I just want to run through a little bit of housekeeping so that people who haven't been here before know how our webinars work. We're going to spend about the next 45 to 60 minutes uh, with our speaker going through the uh, step two of the S3 guidelines. You, you can type questions at any point during the discussion, but we will be saving the questions until the end uh, where I will present the questions to our, our speaker. Due to the very high numbers of attendees tonight, we can only focus on questions relating to tonight's topic, so we won't be able to go off piste uh, with our discussion. Following the webinar, you will be sent a link, an email that will allow you to record your feedback and then you will be able to print off your CPD certificate. So please be patient, that usually will be with you in the next 24 to 48 hours. So on to tonight's main event. Tonight's webinar is brought to you free of charge by the BSP, but also by the very generous support of one of our partner sponsors, Action. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with Action and their very broad product range, including the Neutron Piezo Scaler and their surgical units such as the Cube. But I don't know whether you knew they've also just recently launched a new range of hand instruments called Bliss. If you are interested in any more details, do visit their website or contact their local, uh, your local rep. On to tonight's speaker, which is what you've all turned up for. I'd normally, when I introduce a speaker, do a formal introduction and go through their CV, but I'm not going to do that because we just don't have time. And actually, everybody knows this, this guy. What I will tell you is that last time we did a webinar together, I was the host and, and Ian was our speaker. He was lecturing from his office in his dental school and halfway through the webinar, security came in, turned the lights off and locked the door. So I'm hoping that's not going to happen tonight. Without further ado, I hand you over to Professor Ian Chappell and step two of the S3 guidelines. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, <laughs> you're absolutely right. I've warned the porters tonight. They can't shut the building too early. <laughs> Fingers um, crossed. Otherwise, you'll be there all right. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Um, so, well, thank you. And it's a great, it's always a pleasure to speak uh, to on behalf of the BSP. And I'm re really, really grateful for, uh, for, for this invitation. Um, I'm just showing you a, an official slide from when we did our branding exercise a number of years ago. And Ian and I were reminiscing on what a battle it was to get this through. Um, what I've been asked to talk about tonight is obviously um, step two of the S3 level treatment guidelines. Uh, this is the original workshop uh, held in a beautiful Parador in Segovia, uh, which is where we always meet to hold these workshops. And it's a predominantly um, European affair, but we do have uh, an international flavor. You can see World Genoble here. So we do have representatives from the USA and from Asia as well. The organizing committee looks, there's eight of us, and it looks horribly white male dominated. What, what I can assure you is that there were 27 females in the group, and the most important one is here. This is the boss, Ina Kopp, who is the expert in guideline development in Germany. Uh, and she kept us all um, on track uh, and made sure that we followed the rules correctly and did everything according to um, the, the official guidelines. Otherwise, you have an invalid process. And you can see Nicola smiling away at the back here uh, uh, in, the, in, in the group. So um, this is the uh, original publication from the workshop and um, I just want to step back from it a little bit and I want to start off by just looking at the bigger picture and where Perio fits into the bigger picture of uh, UK dentistry PLC if you like and you may recognize this pyramid it's classically used in management uh, circles and, and Jimmy Steele uh, adapted this in his independent review in 2009 and it really talks about um, public health at the base of the pyramid and improving public health through urgent dental care to prevention uh, and risk guided prevention, then stabilize, stabilizing our patients and then up through minimal interventive approaches to care, uh, recall, review, uh, maintenance or supportive care as we call it, and then into the advanced care at the apex of this pyramid. And basically, um, as we move up the pyramid, patient factors uh, come into play and they become increasingly complex or the patient becomes increasingly more complex uh, and the clinical phases also 
become increasingly complex. And um, that is a model that is now firmly embedded within NHS England uh, and the work that's being done with the Office of the Chief Dental Officer. And I'm pleased to say that uh, this document is under development at the moment. I can't really say a great deal more than that, other than to say that um, the BSP is fully engaged in this process and the steps of care that we're going to talk about uh, are actually embedded in, in this document. So we are, if you like, at a national level, certainly for NHS England, uh, able to ensure that the most up-to-date classification systems, the most up-to-date evidence-based treatment guidelines are embedded uh, in, in, in policy and practice as it, as it comes through. Um, so when I sort of think about PARIO, I've always looked upon PARIO as a staircase. I tend to use this acronym PRICE uh, when I talk about it, uh, the base being public health uh, and population prevention, which is something I think we're incredibly poor at uh, in this country. We rely on our industry partners uh, to get the, uh, the campaigns out there in the media and on the, the, the TV, et cetera, the public health campaigns about prevention and in particular, raising awareness of periodontal health. Um, you know, when did you last see uh, a TV advert from Public Health England that talked about preventing periodontal disease uh, and what might be the cost benefit of something like that? It's an interesting thought, really. I think as the BSP, we've done incredibly well in the last sort of five to 10 years in this area, um, but we've not quite hit the national uh, media yet in terms of TV adverts. They're a bit more expensive. Um, then you go through your risk assessment, your oral health assessment, which should be comprehensive, and you develop your care plan, which is what the R stands for. The I is then intervention, and the earlier the intervention in inflammatory diseases, the better the outcome. That's certainly the case in rheumatoid arthritis, where early aggressive uh, treatment with biologicals and DMARDs actually gives you far better treatment outcomes. And as you know, with diabetes, if we can intervene at the the non-diabetic hyperglycemia stage, what we used to call the pre-diabetes stage, we get better outcomes. And we've seen in the last 12 months with coronavirus, with COVID-19, if we can intervene when the oxygen saturation starts to drop uh, and provide oxygen, we can reduce the number of people that need to go on, on ventilators and therefore reduce mortality rates. And it's no different in perio. The earlier the intervention, the easier the treatment and the better the outcomes for our patients. We then have the review process, which is equally important, the detailed periodontal check chart and the planning of phase two of care. And then we have our exit strategy, which for Perio is never an exit really. Uh, for Perio, it's all about maintenance, rehabilitation and preventing tooth loss. So that's the classic approach. I think it's also important when we look at the steps of care, uh, as you'll see in a minute, um, that we focus on the pathogenesis of the disease. And I apologize for those, those of you that have seen this slide before, I use it quite a lot. It's a cartoon that Steve Offenbacher um, had developed um, and, and sent me uh, to, to use. And what it basically shows you is obviously uh, the periodontal complex as we transition from health to gingivitis. We, um, if the biofilm's allowed to accumulate, then the the bugs sort of irritate the lining sulcular epithelial cells. They send signals into the connective tissues uh, and we get a sort of a, a neutrophilic infiltration and the development of our inflammatory response. That manifests clinically as gingivitis. That's reversible if we reduce and disrupt the biofilm. But in some people, that inflammatory response becomes exaggerated and too strong and actually starts to destroy the alveolar bone and we end up with periodontitis. And I'll come back to that concept of, if you like, the tissue destruction being pre predominantly host driven in response to the bugs, because it's actually really important when we talk about the steps of care. So there's a genetic predisposition um, and that genetic predisposition is something that doesn't always translate to disease, um, but just increases the likelihood if our behavior is perhaps not what it needs to be or our lifestyle or our environment is not where it needs to be. Um, and um, you'll be familiar with this, I suppose. We've all been there when we were younger. The good news is that it doesn't matter what your genetic predisposition is. It, it is possible to modify it 
um, and make sure that the genetics doesn't always translate through into clinical events. I want to also sort of flag as well as the risk because it's related, um, I want to flag this concept of complex diseases and the, cause, the causality of complex diseases. And I tend to refer to uh, Rothman, who's a, a very well-known epidemiologist, who produced a, a theory called the causal pie theory to explain complex diseases. And basically, it's, it's quite straightforward, and you'll, you'll recognise how this probably is pertinent to perio uh, as I go through it. So each of these sufficient causes is a patient. So patient one, patient two, and patient three. And the circle represents the pie, and the pie needs to be full of slices in order for that disease to develop. And you'll notice that in patient one, we have D here, whereas in patient two, we have G. D might be, for example, uh, smoking. G might be hyperglycemia. I might be um, poor coping strategies and high levels of stress. And so there are different slices in different patients. The only commonality is A, and that's obviously the plaque biofilm, because we don't get periodontitis without the plaque, but on its own, it's insufficient to cause the disease. And the reason this is important is, as I'll show you a slide later that Klaus Lang um, uh, lent me, which is a wonderful slide, um, our expectations sometimes of our patients in terms of their plaque control are not compatible sometimes with their lifestyle or with the other aspects to uh, maybe their genetics. And so we have to look at other slices of the pie because if we can knock one of those out, if we can knock the smoking out, we can stabilize the disease perhaps in that patient so that it no longer progresses. But you'll recognize the fact that every one of our patients is slightly different and we can use the same step treatment approach for patient one and it won't produce the effects that it does for patient two or patient three. So we need to think about these other factors at the same time. So the way I sort of describe this sort of pathogenic model now is this is a sort of a, a modification of the classic Page and Kornman model from 1997. So in clinical health, we have low levels of plaque biofilm. The host immune inflammatory response is balanced. It's immune surveillance. It's normal. It's what you'd expect. And there's a symbiosis between the host response and the bugs. Uh, and so the inflammation sort of waxes and wanes, but never really gets a grip. In high-risk patients, we can end up with even relatively low levels of plaque biofilm, um, obviously higher than in health, um, causing problems. So here we have a higher biomass. The host response is still balanced and proportionate, but because we've got this high biomass, it's constantly there and constantly irritating our immune response. The inflammation stops uh, resolving. And so what we end up with is gingival inflammation until we reduce that biomass. If we reduce the biomass, we can shift from here back to here, which is important. Um, but once we go from gingivitis to periodontitis, we have a problem. Um, because periodontitis, uh, once a periodontitis patient, always a periodontitis patient. We can't return them to health, but what we can do is we can give them stability and stop the disease progressing. And that way they keep their teeth for life. So obviously in this patient, the periodontitis patient, we've got a high biomass. We've got this exaggerated immune response. We've got bad bugs, frank dysbiosis emerging, driven actually by the inflammation. And the um, inflammation fails to resolve. And so we end up here with uh, connective tissue and bone destruction, driven predominantly by the host response to that dysbiosis. So we've moved into an era of um, personalized medicine or personalized dental medicine. And that's important because all of those sort of slices in the causal pie that, that I mentioned become relevant here. Because whilst we might have a dysbiosis developing in response to inflammation, and then we get a hyperinflammatory response in response to the dysbiosis, this is a kind of a circular thing that happens. Ultimately, what's really important is the individual patient and um, how they respond to that biofilm and what we can do to support them. So um, let's move on to the process. I, I'm, I'm only going to show you a couple of slides for those of you that may have missed Morris Kebschel's presentation on step one of care. And I just want to flag 
the status of these guidelines. There are different levels of guidelines. S1 is basically a group of experts getting together uh, and, and writing on the back of an envelope uh, what they feel is the best way of managing things. Um, S2C is uh, a little bit more uh, of a formal process. You have a representative guideline group, if you like, that is structured, but you don't have systematic reviews. S2E is a higher level where you do have systematic reviews. So the E stands for the evidence, um, as opposed to the C for the, for the consensus. And the S3 level is really putting everything together. So you have the systematic reviews, all the evidence to underpin uh, the recommendations, and you have a representative guideline group. And that's not just a bunch of people from Perio, it includes people from Endo, from Restorative, from, from a whole host of other um, scopes and, and spheres in dentistry, public health, and uh, in our case, patients. Um, so, you know, Nicola and Moritz put the British adultment together and I'll be honest, I'm saying this because I'm biased, it was more representative than the original EFP one because we had patient representatives feeding into this process and it was incredibly uh, valuable having those patients involved and it helped us a great deal. And then ultimately what you end up with is um, the quality of the evidence, as you can see here on the left of my slide, and the strength of the recommendation. And the two don't necessarily go together. So high quality evidence we would normally use to drive a, rec a strong recommendation where we'd use the terminology, we recommend something. If the evidence is moderate, we'd use the terminology we suggest, which is not so strong. Uh, and if it's low or very low, we would basically say, you can think about it or you can consider it. But the bottom line is we don't know. The evidence is, is uncertain and therefore it's a kind of an open recommendation. But unfortunately, if you just look at the evidence on its own, there are other factors that you miss, such as the balance of benefit or harm, the size of the effect that you get with a particular treatment or treatment recommendation, or in fact, patient preferences, or uh, indeed uh, environmental factors. There are a whole host of other factors, uh, financial economic considerations being a major one. You know, just because a particular treatment is fantastic doesn't mean every patient can afford it. So um, they modify, if you like, the recommendation strength. So you can go down in terms of the strength of the recommendation from the quality of the evidence, or you can go up. Uh, and so what I'm going to be showing you are basically some tables, um, and those tables take into account these factors down here, where the consensus and the discussion within the group uh, drives the tables. So just to give you an example, um, this is uh, addressing a question on regenerative surgery. Um, and the recommendation here is that, this is obviously from step three, is we recommend treating teeth with residual deep pockets associated with intrabony defects of three millimeters or deeper with periodontal regenerative surgery. This is um, based on 22 RCTs. So it's a high quality systematic review. Luigi Nibali was the, the author of this one. Um, so lots of evidence, and that enables us then to make our recommendation. And in this case, uh, it's, a, it's a grade A recommendation, which is designated by two upward arrows because it's a recommendation in favor of. Uh, we could recommend against strongly, in which case it would be two down arrows. And then ultimately we have to record the consensus. How many people vote in favor of that recommendation? How many people vote against it? And how many people abstain due to a conflict of interest? Because uh, you have to abstain from voting. We record those conflicts of interest so that we know which people shouldn't be voting because of that conflict of interest. It's quite a, a robust and ordered process. So let's get back to our steps of care then. Um, and this time, if we look at the steps of care as they are written in the guideline, um, step zero is kind of something that we assume is happening all the time. We are going to have to make a diagnosis of our patients. Uh, we're going to have to risk assess them and come up with a care plan. And then step one, which you heard about in the last webinar, is all about controlling those risk factors, educating the patient, getting the oral hygiene right, um, 
and then the provision of the professional mechanical plaque removal, um, which would be scaling, uh, largely supragingival scaling, but it could be subgingival scaling of the crown of the tooth as well. Um, and then obviously um, step two, which is what I'm going to go to into more detail on this evening, which is about the subgingival PNPR, the subgingival management of that patient with or without adjunctive approaches. Then step three is your <clears throat> three monthly check and your revaluation and retreatment of non responder sites uh, where you may consider non surgical or surgical approaches. And then step four is our exit plan, which hopefully is going to be supportive care and it's not going to involve tooth extractions. But I'm going to focus on obviously step two. And the great thing about the guidelines, um, unlike the classification system, I think there was a lesson learned by the EFP from the classification system because obviously as the BSP we produced our sort of uh, implementation plan that enabled us to implement it within the UK system uh, in, a, in a very simple and pragmatic manner. The guidelines were set up in a way that allowed us to adopt them which means to go through them all, update the evidence and there was quite a bit of evidence to update from the original workshop and then hold our own consensus meeting and produce our own guidelines and these are the guidelines uh, published in the Journal of Dentistry and um, the BSP have got a lot more uh, in place to help disseminate these guidelines um, and you've probably heard about that from Nicola if not I can assure you there are flow charts coming and video animations and all kinds of really good stuff to uh, as well as a very brief publication to summarize it all in the British Dental Journal in due course. So um, the four steps to care are embedded within here. The flow chart, this is um, a draft of it. This isn't the final version, but it's just to give you a feel. The flow chart has been produced to really simplify things. Um, step one's been covered. I want to talk about the re-evaluation here because this is critical. Because within certainly NHS dentistry in the future, you aren't really going to be progressing patients from step one to step two unless they are demonstrably engaging with plaque control and behavior change. And I don't want to go into the details on this uh, particular flow chart, but suffice to say, uh, we have defined what engagement looks like. It's very similar to what Shazad Slim has done in Healthy Gums Do Matter, in fact, uh, incredibly close uh, to, to what he's done there. And if the patient engages, then they move on to step two where you're involved in more time consuming and therefore more costly treatment because it's a subgingival debridement uh, that's required, which takes uh, more time than step one. Uh, and if they're not engaging, they remain in step one, rather like smoking cessation actually, uh, until they are willing to engage or showing an interest in engaging, we don't really move to step two. We just review, uh, perhaps undertake some very brief um, behavior change advice to reinforce the message um, and then if they start to engage, they move into step two. And then step two, we have the re-evaluation again after three months, uh, and the rest of it is essentially, as I've really said uh, earlier on, I won't repeat it. So this flowchart will be available shortly, um, hopefully in the next week or so. There's a couple of things I just wanted to go through before um, moving on to the specific, uh, the specific step two boxes. Um, and, and this is a sort of um, a model of the evidence base that, that I use quite a lot when trying to describe um, the course of periodontal treatment. We've obviously got the different levels of risk here, but on the y-axis what we've got is the amount of disease when the patient first presents. So uh, this is number of disease sites against the step of care on the, uh, on the uh, x-axis. And step one of therapy, which involves two components really, there's the education and the oral hygiene instruction gives us by far the greatest benefit in terms of uh, managing that disease and there's oodles of evidence out there to support this. When we do our uh, supragingival PMPR we get a further benefit. When we move into step two and we undertake our subgingival instrumentation then we get even further benefit. And then in step three, when we re-instrument the non-responding sites, further benefit, and then we end up hopefully in periodontal maintenance. We won't have 100% of sites that are 
four millimeters or below closed pockets without bleeding, we might end up with a handful of sites that we need to monitor very, very carefully uh, over time. But basically, by far the biggest gain comes here. That's setting the foundation stone. So step one is the most important step. Um, and as we move along to the right, it becomes more costly and less cost effective, if you like, apart from step four, which is very cost effective and critical to long term success. So um, in terms of step one that Moritz covered, I like to show this, this, this slide I mentioned from Klaus Lang. This is what we expect our patients to do, isn't it? We're, we're evangelical about this. Um, and I wonder how many of us could achieve what we ask our patients to achieve um, ourselves. It's, it's not an easy one, is it? Um, now, obviously, we don't expect them to do this all at the same time. Um, but sometimes what we ask is perhaps too much for some patients. And um, th this is a, a chap I like to talk about because it really brings that message home. You know, why would you move to step two unless you've got step one right? This, this chap is a neurosurgeon who um, basically failed his first appointment when he came to see me. So um, I, I refused um, to send him another appointment and his PA got on the phone and, and caused a real hassle with my poor secretary. Uh, so we agreed to book him in because he was such an important chap. Um, and so we booked him in. He turned up 20 minutes late for his second appointment. So again, I refused to see him because I had another patient in the chair. Um, and you can imagine that went down like a lead balloon. It was my poor nurse who had to go and break the news to him, actually. Um, and so the next phone call came in. And so I eventually agreed to see him one more time on the basis that he turned up and he turned up on time, which he did. Unfortunately, I was running 40 minutes late which didn't help his demeanor when he came into the surgery and sat down and degranulated for a good minute and a half about how important he was and how rude I'd been not sending him for another, uh, sending another appointment to him. He's got the patient's basilar artery in his hands. He's in theater 16 hours a day. He's a busy chap. And I listened to him for a long time and then eventually um, smiled at him and said, well, it's very simple. You don't need to be a neurosurgeon to understand this one. But basically, if you don't turn up to your appointment, I can't treat you. If you come 20 minutes late, I still can't treat you um, because I've got another patient in the chair. And by the way, if I ever develop a glioblastoma, you are the last neurosurgeon on this planet that I'm going to come to see because you are unfit to be practicing. You're in the operating theatre beyond the legal hours. And if you don't have time to look after your own health, then uh, why should I trust you to look after my health? And um, it was a great message, it was pure luck really, but it was a great message because what I'd done inadvertently was challenged his professionalism. Uh, and he became an incredibly motivated patient, a phenomenally motivated patient, I might add. This is him in 2007 in March. And you can see the apical root resorption on his lower incisors, that really needs root filling. You can see how we've got periendo lesions happening here and okay, we had to section that tooth and splint it, but actually this is him in June, three months after non-surgical treatment. So we've done our step two, look at the bone regeneration, who needs endo? We did need to root fill this one, this one didn't sort of resolve on its own. Um, and so that was root filled. And this is him 10 years later, after the orthodontics has been done to close the gaps in his teeth. It's very quick, very little bone, teeth move very quickly, light forces, um, but you know, that's the kind of an outcome you can achieve just with step two of care if you get that motivation right. Uh, and he literally spends 15 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening cleaning his teeth. He no longer operates beyond nine hours. The rest of the team have to chip in and he does it in, uh, in shifts as you're supposed to do. So quite a big behavior change, a massive lifestyle change. Uh, and not all patients will make that decision to do it. But if they do, then we can move into step two and we can achieve that type of outcome. So one of the things that we had to do um, when talking about the steps of care was we had to clarify some of the terminology because it's changed, hasn't it? We, PNPR is a European term. Um, it's, it's not a term we've traditionally used. And so what the BSP have done, and this is now on the website, is produce, if you like, a, a summary chart of how those traditional terms map to what we now refer to as supragingival PMPR. So you can see here, I won't go through it all, that prophylaxis, polishing this 
horrible term scale and polish or scaling of the crowns of teeth, how they all relate to um, super gingival PMPR. Um, as I say, it's on the website. Um, we've done the same for the subgingival PMPR because you can scale the root surface of a tooth to remove calculus. We call that subgingival scaling of the root. Uh, there's also subgingival debridement. There's also subgingival instrumentation or root surface instrumentation. And there is also root surface debridement as well. So there are multiple terms that essentially are now categorized under subgingival PMPR. And then there's this very old fashioned and obsolete term, root planing, and there's curatage. Um, we use curettes, um, but actually we don't undertake curatage unless we're managing a periodontal abscess that needs draining. But the biggest success is this one. And just to re reinforce this message, I, I just came off um, a meeting with the Chief Dental Officer where Sara apologised to me for slipping and using the term scale and polish. So I can assure you that um, the OCDO are very familiar with the fact that this term needs to be consigned to the bin because it's derogatory, meaningless, uh, and we have far better ways of describing what we do that have more benefit. So here's our first um, recommendation. Um, Recommendation 2.1, we recommend that subgingival instrumentation be employed to treat periodontitis in order to reduce probing pocket depths, gingival inflammation, and the number of disease sites. And you're sitting there thinking, well, of course we do. It's obvious. We've known this for years. Well, we have, but actually there's very little evidence to support it. There is only one underpowered three-month RCT uh, that really compared uh, subgingival instrumentation with supragingival in instrumentation alone. That's all we have. Um, and so this was a point of debate. Uh, if the evidence isn't really there, how can we make this recommendation? Uh, there are 11 pro or there were 11 prospective studies uh, looking at the impact of subgingival uh, instrumentation over time, demonstrating the benefit, but they're not RCTs. And of course, the reason is that We've known this for, for so many decades and practiced it for so many decades. Um, it would be unethical to undertake an RCT where you didn't do it. And that's why there have been no more RCTs, uh, because it would create an ethical problem. So this is one of those recommendations that has a very limited evidence base, but based on decades, literally decades of professional um, uh, 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 practice and an expert view, we know that this has to be a strong recommendation with a double upward arrow. Um, then there's this sort of thorny issue of should we leave the calculus behind or do we need to remove it? And I always have one, I used to have wonderful debates with Phil Auer and, uh, and Graham Smart, and I do with Ian Dunn about this now. And, and actually, we're all on the same page, but but some people do get confused. So what I, I thought I would do is take you through the evidence for and against. And it gives me the opportunity to take you through Val Clarehue's PhD, which is what you can see here, published in 1990, this paper. And it was a really important paper. Um, and this is the paper or a paper that makes the case that you need to remove the calculus. Um, the aims of the study were to, she looked basically at 14 year olds over a five year period. So they were reviewed at 16 and 19 years of age and looked at interdental attachment loss um, of a millimeter or more um, at each of those time points. So we know we're dealing with periodontitis, we're not dealing with um, uh, toothbrush induced uh, recession, for example. And she managed to get just under 170 at all of those time points back having measured clinical attachment loss at the mesobuckle aspect of first molars, premolars, and central incisors. And she also looked at visible plaque, subgingival calculus, uh, gingival contour, and bleeding. And this is what she found. This is the site prevalence of attachment loss of a millimeter or more at each of those time points. Not a lot happening at 14 years of age, as you would expect. But when we've got to 16 years of age, nearly 30% of upper first molars and 10% of lower incisors have lost a millimetre or more of attachment loss. And by the time they get to 19 and a half, 
we're close to 60% of upper first molars and 50% of lower incisors have actually lost attachment. And this is not grade C disease, as you will see. This is not what we used to call aggressive periodontitis. This is what we used to call chronic periodontitis. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute. She did exactly the same thing here, but this time looking for two millimeters or more of attachment loss, so even more attachment loss. And uh, actually, not a lot happening at 14 starting to see something happening at 16. This is quite a bit of attachment loss for a 16 year old, but it's starting to happen on the upper first molars. And then by the time they get to 19 and a half, 10% of upper first molars and somewhere between two and 7% of either lower incisors or lower first molars have lost two millimeters or more of attachment. But what was important here was um, that the prevalence of subgingival calculus increased from 15% to 51% in that time period. Now we know that calculus doesn't cause periodontitis, uh, far from it, but, but what it does do is it retains the biofilm subgingivally and supergingivally, so it increases risk. Um, and I've given you these results, between 55 and almost 60% of maxillary first molars of 19 year olds had a millimeter or more of attachment loss. Similar picture for the lower incisors. Um, there was a significant association between subgingival calculus being present at 14 years of age and the subsequent attachment loss, um, and a significant association between baseline plaque levels at 14 years of age and subsequent attachment loss. And so, is this myth or reality that we should remove the calculus? Because Val's work would indicate that actually we should probably remove it, shouldn't we? Well, maybe not. Let me share some of Phil our slides. Phil and I share slides on this particular subject. So these are some of um, Phil's slides showing cases where the calculus hasn't been removed. This is a patient who's been basically told about their risk. They've been educated. Uh, the plaque uh, controls being being reinforced. They've been reviewed. And if you look, actually, there is a reduction in inflammation down here. There's a big reduction here. Bleeding's disappeared and the subgingival calculus is now becoming supergingival, so it's easier to remove. Different case, another one of Phil's, lots of inflammation here, plenty of plaque, and then just with oral hygiene instruction alone, there's been some resolution of the inflammation, much less inflammation here, and now the subgingival calculus is appearing supergingively. So do you really need to remove it, or is it just about the plaque control? So what are the key facts here? Well, we know that supergingival debridement and meticulous home care gives a beneficial change in that subgingival biofilm, but it's not necessarily sustainable. So the disease will continue to progress unless we do our subgingival debridement, hence the recommendation that I've just given you, you've got to do it really to get a decent outcome. And um, probing pocket depths do um, relate to disease progression. So the deeper they are at the start, the more likely those sites are to progress. And we're aiming for these closed pockets of four millimeter non-bleeding sites or below. Trouble is that the threshold of plaque control required by one individual differs from the next. So we've got to titrate what we do according to our experience of working with that patient. And remember, 20% of the variance of periodontal disease only is explained by the bugs. 80% is explained by the host response. So that leads me on to the work of Bernie Kieser. Um, and Bernie was quite a visionary. He, he looked at some original research done by Sturie Nyman uh, quite some time ago, back in the mid 80s, where what Sturie had done is he'd done sort of split mouth, um, so open flap debridement, um, where he'd left the calculus behind in half the mouth and removed it in the other half of the mouth. And all he'd done really was polish the biofilm off on the half of the mouth where he left the calculus behind. And he showed no difference in attachment gain between the two uh, sides when he did it, sort of indicating that you might not need to remove the calculus. Bernie and working with um, uh, you know, people like Graham Smart, for example, uh, and also Phil and also Mary Moore, as she was at the time now, Mary Gibson, did a lot of work looking at how easy it was to remove the endotoxin. And you can basically wash it off with a three-in-one syringe quite effectively. So if we were able to do that, um, then we would decontaminate the root surface and theoretically the patient would heal. So we can go to lighter debridement pressures 
uh, preserve valuable cementum that's viable so we can get some bone regeneration hopefully even without tissue regeneration um, but that might mean leaving a little bit of calcus behind does it really matter nobody's ever done the study um, that shows whether that works with a non-surgical approach or not well actually that's not true um, we did the study back in 2002 but we never published it uh, and let me just share this study with you because there's an important lesson to learn from this. This was not a brilliant design. It was 24 people with what we call chronic periodontitis at the time. We split the mouth in half. Um, we had an ultrasonic scaler that was modified by Densplice that it, 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 it buzzed and, and a light flashed when you touched the root surface. So we were able to treat half the mouth without really contacting the root surface just by irrigating and washing the endotoxin out as Bernie and his team's work had shown. And then the other half of the mouth was treated traditionally, but we spent the same amount of time on both halves of the mouth. So every quadrant had a good 45 minutes of treatment, quite a lot. Um, no debridement on the test side, as I said. And we followed these people up for nine months. And, and here's the data. This is the change in percentage of sites with plaque over the nine month period between the um, minimal contact, we called it, and the, um, the contact traditional method, no difference. Here's the difference in bleeding on probing, no difference. Here's the difference in probing pocket depth, um, no difference. There looks to be a difference here at six months in favor of actually removing the calculus, but if you look at the scale, it's only 0.3 of a millimetre and actually the variance was so huge that wasn't statistically significantly different and there was definitely no difference at all at nine months. And there's no difference in attachment gain either. When we looked at the deep pockets where you'd think there'd be the biggest negative impact of leaving the calculus behind, actually uh, no difference at all in, in reduction in programming pocket depth and um, getting up towards two millimetres on both test and control sides. And um, similarly here in terms of bleeding no real difference. So we never published that paper and it was a conscious decision. The data was presented at the IADR and Jan Linder at the time and, and um, Jürgen Slots at the time both asked me if I'd send the paper into their journals but, but, but I decided against it. And, and this is um, an editorial I wrote in, in Perio 2000. It was dedicated to Bernie Kieser. Um, and I'm really pleased to say that Bernie was able to see the entire volume uh, because it was the week before he died and I sent him the proofs and he phoned me up one evening, absolutely, it was his life's work, he was absolutely thrilled to bits that actually he'd made the difference he'd been trying to make for so long. And I explained in this why we hadn't published it and the reason was that if we put a message out there that you could leave the calculus behind, then actually you can imagine what's gonna happen, can't you? Um, the work's just not going to be done properly, patients not going to have the behaviour change and advice, calculus are going to be left behind, claims are going to be made, and it will be, ah, oh, well, the Birmingham group said that you don't have to remove the calculus, and they've proved it, look at that study. So actually, I remember speaking to Bernie about it because I didn't want to misrepresent him in the editorial, and I said, look, Bernie, you don't really seriously suggest calculus is left behind. He said, of course not. But he said, what I do suggest is that we preserve the cementum and we use light pressures. Um, but obviously, if the calculus is there, it's important to remove it. So um, that was from the master himself, from words from his mouth just a week before we lost him. And it's important when we're planning care for patients like this, because this lady's got anterior drifting. She's got a lot of bone loss. She's probably at a stage, probably at a stage four almost here, apical third bone loss. Um, but she's motivated. This is her after non-surgical treatment. She wants the diastema closing. So it's important to us we know that we haven't left deposits behind that are going to increase her risk uh, of the disease activating during ortho. She has the orthodontics done and she ends up in a decent place. And we put a gingival veneer on to hide the black triangle and a great outcome for her. So calculus removal is not necessary. Well, actually, that's true if you get the plaque control right and you get rid of the endotoxin. But in reality, it's a different question that we should be answering here. And the question is, should we be removing the calculus? And I think the answer to that is yes, we should. Um, 
So let's have a look then at the next question, which is, are treatment outcomes of subgingival instrumentation better if you use handle-powered instruments? Actually, the evidence base right back to 1981 and 84 in Anita Baddiston's papers, uh, there's no difference in outcome between the two. So the grade of the recommendation is the strongest grade. Uh, it doesn't matter what you use. And that obviously, as you know, has helped us through COVID by being able to uh, work uh, using hand instruments. I must be honest, our students have become phenomenally skilled by only using hand instruments. My worry is that they might over instrument. And so we've now got them back on ultrasonics as well. Uh, but boy, oh boy, do they now, have to, now know how to treat periodontal disease. One of the few benefits of COVID, uh, really. Are treatment outcomes when delivered quadrant wise over multiple visits or as a full mouth procedure, are they different uh, when, when delivered by those two methods? Uh, and this is recommendation 2.3. We suggest that subgingival periodontal instrumentation can be performed with either quadrant wise traditional approach or the full mouth delivery within 24 hours. Um, the grade of that recommendation is not as strong. Uh, it's really a suggestion not, a, not a, a particularly strong recommendation. And I just want to give you some background to that. This is the last bit of research I'm going to show you because the rest of the recommendations are quite quick to go through. But let's just have a look at this. Concept of one stage therapy. This came from a very good friend of mine, Mark Kirianen. Um, and, and I'm going to take you through some of Mark's work just to explain it. But the concept here is that we know that most subgingival bugs will colonize other oral niches, not just the pocket, dorsum of tongue, posterior third, tonsillar fossa, other areas of the mouth. And we know that if we focus treatment on getting rid of those pathogens, then we'll get better clinical outcomes. If the pathogens persist, however, the outcomes are poorer. So maybe we need to disinfect the other parts of the mouth. Um, we know the treatment drops the microbial load a thousand fold, but unfortunately, some of those organisms start to re recolonize again as early as a week after treatment. So it may well be if we space treatment out, theoretically, we could get reinfection of treated quadrants and treated sites from non-treated sites. That was the, the rationale here. So maybe we should get rid of the bugs from all oral niches to reduce the risk of reinfection. And if we're gonna do that, maybe we should squirt a bit of chlorhexidine around the place as well to see if we can clear it from the tonsils and the, and, and, and the dorsum of the tongue. But this is Mark's first paper. He will admit himself that it was an underpowered study, but it was a long time ago, it was back in 1995. And the aim was to, act to see if full mouth debridement performed within 24 hours improved treatment outcomes. There were only 10 people in the study, five were treated with the full mouth approach, five were treated with the traditional quadrant by quadrant approach. An hour was spent per quadrant in both of those uh, approaches, so it was really, really thoroughly done. And then they squirted chlorhexidine into every orifice in the mouth they possibly could to try and disinfect everything. Um, and basically they followed up at one and two months. What they found was that the clinical outcomes uh, improved in both groups, as you would expect. The difference at two months was trivial, frankly. It was only 0.3 millimetres for single-rooted teeth and only 0.1 millimetre for multi-rooted teeth. It was significantly better for the one-stage approach, but actually that's clinically not relevant. Uh, and as I've mentioned, the study was underpowered um, and statistical significance is not necessarily what we're looking for here. There were also two smokers in the control group so 40% of the control group would have a poorer treatment outcome anyhow. Um, so it, was, it turned out retrospectively in hindsight to be a biased study, even though it wasn't planned that way. There were a number of studies I've just summarized. I've, I've listed three here from the Leuven group that showed significant benefit from that one stage full mouth approach. And then um, a follow-up study with 12 patients in each group this time, looking again uh, at the model to see if treatment outcomes improved. So three groups of 12 patients. First test group had the traditional approach done, SRP scaling and root planing as we used to call it, at two weekly intervals. Test group two had the full mouth approach done in one visit. Test group three had the same but with chlorhexidine squirted everywhere and they were followed up for eight months. 
and basically we saw significant improvements in both pocket depth reduction, uh, clinical attachment gain and reductions in bleeding for all three groups. With the um, one stage approach they got additional attachment gains of two millimeters and pocket depth reductions of 1.5 millimeters at deep sites. I would put it to you that is that is clinically relevant. No additional benefit from chlorhexidine, uh, which we always knew uh, for treating peri disease that is, but, and it's a big but, the clinical improvements in the control group were much smaller than the literature reports. And you have to ask the question why that is, because what that is doing is it's biasing your control group so that your, con so that your test group is more likely to produce a positive outcome. So then came along in 2004, a Greek girl, Danaya Patsidou, this is her PhD uh, study. I, I was the examiner and it was a really nice piece of work. And uh, what she did was she did the same thing, but she said, well, let's do it in 12 hours, full mouth approach in 12 hours. We'll make it a bigger study, 40 patients, uh, two groups of 20. Test group can have the full mouth approach in 12 hours. Control group will do the traditional quadrant uh, approach. Forget the chlorhexidine. Um, we'll spend an hour per quadrant, so we'll do it properly. We're going to use ultrasonic scalars and curettes, and we'll follow them up for six months. And what she produced was consistent with the literature. And that is pocket depth reductions of almost two millimetres and attachment gains of over a millimetre. Uh, and at deeper sites, nearly three millimetre pocket depth reductions and attachment gains of a millimetre. No difference in outcomes at six months between the two approaches. Both methods work was her conclusion. And she did microbiology and immunology uh, in the other chapters of her thesis to, to sort of reinforce that, that outcome, different to the Leuven group. And then when we looked at other follow-on studies that didn't come from Leuven, they all showed the same thing as Apatzidou did. Okay, so there was a problem here. And what do we make of the problem? Because anybody that knows Mark Kurienin and Wim Turgles will know they're very honest scientists and they do really good science, but there was something odd here. So um, logic would tell us that the full mouth approach should work best, um, but it's only been shown by the Leuven group. And um, we know that it's more uncomfortable to do it in one session. It's not a particularly brilliant practice builder. Patients get more discomfort afterwards. You get a, a temperature rise as well, so you get a Schwarzman reaction, which is perhaps not a good idea. We know it's quicker to do the one-stage approach initially, but actually Jan Venstrom showed later that, that it, you have more sites to retreat with the, with the one-stage approach, so the, uh, the shortening of the treatment regime is not as much as you might think it is. And so I eventually got on the phone to Mark and said, what the hell's going on here, Mark? You know, you're the only group that can show this. Take me through it. Uh, and why are you calling every study a pilot study? You've done nine pilot studies. Why? Sorry, not pilot, proof of principle. Why have you done nine proof of principle studies? Um, and he said, well, we've done proof of principle because we wanted to show that if you um, don't remove that biofilm, there's a chance of reinfection of untreated sites. And the way that we designed the studies, and there's one line in one of the papers that says this, is that for the control group, where you're treating quadrant by quadrant, they stop them using interdental cleaning aids for the period of the study. So you're taking a patient who you're trying to motivate, and you're saying you can't clean between your teeth uh, for the rest of this study. So that kind of explained why um, the results were poorer in the uh, control group than you would expect from the literature. And it also explained why uh, the one stage approach appeared to give a better result for the Leuven group, whereas it didn't for any other groups because they weren't trying to prove this principle and they were actually allowing patients to clean interdentally. Not a lot of people know that. Uh, and when we did the European workshop back in 2008 in Ittigen on this, Klaus Lang and his team that did the systematic reviews on this also didn't know that because it was one line in the paper. And so the conclusion of the workshop was actually there are inconsistent and small differences to be found between the one stage approach and the staged approach. And therefore, you can use either. Um, and so really, the, we flagged at that point the fact that in the Leuven studies, the reductions were less than you would expect in the control group because I revealed it to class at that point. He immediately turned around to his poor research fellow and said, why didn't you pick it up? 
and I had to defend her and say, well, actually, there's one sentence in the paper, in one paper, and everybody missed it, including me. And it was only when I spoke to Mark that uh, he pointed out that's what they've been doing. There's one other issue with the with the one stage approach, and that's this paper that won the Jacquard Prize at Euro Perry in 2015 uh, or 16, whenever it was. And that is uh, this insult to the immune system of doing the one stage approach. Um, and you get a huge bacteremia when you do this. And this was a study by Filippo Graziani and colleagues where they basically did the full mouth and the quadrant approach and they reviewed the patients after a day, seven days uh, and three months and they measured inflammatory markers in the bloodstream, C-reactive protein, IL-6 and TNF-alpha and they showed that at 24 hours you got three times the CRP spike uh, with the one stage approach, two times the IL-6 levels and more TNF-alpha so probably not a good idea to be doing it all in one go or in 24 hours with somebody who may have a heart condition uh, or where you're concerned about inflammation, systemic inflammation. Okay, so next one. Uh, the rest are fairly quick now. Are adjunctive physical agents superior to subgingival instrumentation alone? By that we mean lasers. Uh, and the answer to that was um, that we suggest not to use lasers as adjuncts to subgingival instrumentation. And also we suggest not to use anti antimicrobial um, photodynamic, sorry, adjunctive photodynamic therapy. Um, there's a story behind this one as well. Um, so why did we say that for lasers? Because it called, caused quite a stir in the, in, in, in the industry, as you can imagine. Well, the reason was because the laser uh, work was too heterogeneous. The, the systematic reviews showed that there were basically two broad groups of lasers uh, in terms of wave banks, as you, as you can see here. And the RCTs had to employ a six month follow up and they had to look at pocket depth reduction as the primary outcome. That was the whole point of the focus question that was set. So you couldn't mix treatments and there were single applications only. And there were two RCTs on that particular wavelength, as you can see, and three on the other wavelength. And, but they used different lasers, different tip diameters within those wavelength groups. There were different wavelengths. There was a whole host of variables. And the bottom line was that there was simply insufficient evidence to recommend adjunctive lasers to subgingival root surface treatment. That's not to say they may not work, but the evidence wasn't strong enough to make that recommendation. And there are also issues of safety and the cost benefit. Lasers are expensive and that cost has to be transmitted to the patient ultimately. The antimicrobial photodynamic therapy was even trickier. Um, this letter is going to appear, or this is our response letter, uh, should I say, in April's edition of the Journal of Clinical Perio. It's online at the moment and this is Dr. Carla Damante, who was challenging the outcome of the um, recommendation on adjunctive photodynamic therapy. And that's the letter I wrote with Soren Yepsen, just trying to explain to her why the outcome was what it was. She's an expert in APDT, she did her PhD on it, but there were some misunderstandings and it's important that um, we clarify those. Firstly, um, you have to answer the focus question in the systematic reviews. And those, that focus question was focusing on untreated patients. She was talking about uh, some new RCTs on patients in maintenance phase, and that's not what the question was set out uh, to, to answer. So that was the first point. Secondly, the RCTs had to be longer than six months, and they had to have probing pocket depth as a primary outcome. And in most of the studies that she sent us to back a claim, that wasn't the case. So they couldn't have been included. She also had repeat therapies in there. And if you're going to repeat an adjunctive photodynamic therapy, well, why wouldn't you just repeat the RSD uh, as you would do at step three, review and re-instrument? So um, because that would be the standard of care currently. Um, and, and so we couldn't include multiple applications. This was a point that she made that's a good point. Two of the studies on APDT used a laser wavelength that actually didn't match the absorption peak of the photosensitizer dye. In other words, you haven't got 
a photodynamic therapy effect in two of the studies that were included, which is a very good point, um, because you don't. So it shows you that systematic reviews can be limited, and in particular meta reviews can be limited, because you can't go into the granular detail of the individual trials. However, she missed the most important point, and that is that the majority of the studies, in fact all but one, were split mouth designs. So you're probably going to get wash over of the photodynamic therapy dye uh, from your test site to your control site. So you might get some benefit at the control site in split mouth designs, which is going to mean that the outcome of the study works against the photodynamic therapy. There was only one study that was a parallel design, and actually um, it did show a benefit to adjunctive photodynamic therapy uh, over the, um, the arm that uh, didn't use it. So uh, the bottom line is, I can reassure you that the systematic review by Salvi et al is correct in its outcome, and the American Academy systematic review on uh, adjunctive photodynamic therapy by Sean Brom and colleagues is also correct. So last couple of minutes really, just to finish off. Um, Recommendation 2.6, we do not, uh, um, we recommend not to use uh, local administration of statin gels, not sufficient evidence and all from the same group. Same for probiotics currently. It's not such a strong recommendation because the literature is emerging all the time on that and I suspect that will change in due course, but this is a suggestion not to use probiotics. There's a suggestion not to use subantimicrobial doxycycline. Time doesn't permit me to go into the reasons for that one. Um, and we recommend not to use uh, locally delivered bisphosphonates. Yes, there are studies about local bisphosphonate delivery as adjunctive to um, root surface therapy. And essentially, there were the same outcomes for non-steroidals as adjuncts, for omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids as adjuncts, and also for metformin gel as adjuncts. They were all uh, um, fairly strong recommendations against. In terms of adjunctive chemical agents to subgingival instrumentation, um, that was an open recommendation for adjunctive antiseptics. You can consider it, um, specifically chlorhexidine mouth rinses for a limited period of time um, because of obviously of the staining. Uh, in terms of the sustained release, again, an open recommendation. You can consider it because there is some evidence, but actually uh, there's evidence for and against. That's down to individual practitioner uh, choice. Um, when it comes to recommendation 2.15, specific locally administered sustained release antibiotics in this case, as opposed to the periochip really, which is what we're talking about with 2.14, so locally uh, administered sustained release and, and antibiotics, again, an open recommendation there. You can consider it. This is the important one, really. Um, so this is about the use of adjunctive systemic antibiotics. And let me just read this to you, and then I'll, I'll give you the last couple of slides. I'll give you the background to it. So because, so we divided this into two. Recommendation 2.16a, due to concerns about patients' health, and the impact of systemic antibiotic use on public health. This is about antimicrobial stewardship, really. Um, the routine use of adjunctive um, systemic antibiotics is not recommended. Okay, that's a very clear recommendation, strong two downward arrows, double A recommendation against, we shouldn't be doing this. Recommendation B, the adjunctive use of specific systemic antibiotics may be considered for particular patient categories. And they would be people who had what we used to call aggressive periodontitis. So grade C disease in young people that is inconsistent with their levels of plaque control, or perhaps generalized grade three uh, or four periodontitis in young people. So the background to that, because this is an example of where we're saying that the evidence is not driving the recommendation. Um, this really was Wim Turgle's systematic review. It did show benefits to the use, in particular, of the periopil metronidazole and amoxicillin uh, at six and 12 months. Uh, and they were statistically significantly greater gains in attachment, reductions in pocket depths. But there was no real data 
uh, of any significance on uh, 12 months and that, that was a limitation if you like of some of these studies. And in terms of the clinical relevance, well actually the effect size was decent, you get about a 40 to 50 percent increased effect uh, from using systemic antibiotics but actually you don't need to, you can get decent outcomes without using systemic antibiotics um, and most of the data focused only on the perio pill and not other, uh, other antibiotics but the biggie here is about um, uh, systemic antibiotic regimes and microbial resistance um, and that was really what drove a unanimous consensus really on that one towards um, not using systemic antibiotics except in specific um, cases and if you think about it those specific cases would be referred to level two or level three anyhow so in general practice this is effectively saying you shouldn't be using systemic antibiotics as adjuncts for perio treatment if they're going to be used the decision should be made by a level two or a level three um, specialist so to conclude because that's my hour up subgingival pmpr is effective and necessary for periodontal stability root surface instrumentation can be undertaken either by hand or mechanical instruments. Um, root surface instrumentation or subgenual PMPR, uh, whatever you want to call it, can be undertaken stepwise or in one stage because there's no difference in outcomes. The one stage approach does induce an, an acute phase response. So you need to think about that if, you, if you're considering doing it. The adjunctive physical methods uh, in terms of lasers currently lack sufficient evidence due to the heterogeneity of the studies and adjunctive host modulating agents currently lack sufficient evidence and adjunctive chemical agents may be of benefit uh, on a case-by-case -case basis and adjunctive local delivery antimicrobials antibiotics may be of benefit again on a case-by-case -case basis but systemic antibiotics should not be used unless it's in a level two or three setting is the implication for specific cases. So um, what I hope I've now covered is um, level two um, and level three is on its way so um, coming soon to a PC near you via this uh, webinar approach um, it, it's about uh, it will follow this one and I'm just going to finish by strongly recommending for those of you who are in doubt that you go and get vaccinated, please. Um, don't just think about yourselves. Think about the people who may die as a result of us not getting um, um, herd immunity in our population. I wouldn't recommend the, the Russian vaccine here. Um, it, it, it's quite toxic, as you can see. And I also would caution you against having the injection given by one of our wonderful retired nurses who are being brought out of retirement, um, as you can see here. So um, thank you for your attention, Ian. Um, I, think we're, uh, I think we're open for questions now. So are we allowed to take the Russian vaccine with tonic, maybe orally, <laughs> on a Friday evening? That, That's that, a, that could be yes. maybe something we could consider, but pro we'll yeah, probably get the proper orally. vaccine as well. Yeah, take it all, Ian. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much, Ian. I always enjoy listening to your presentations. I always have a lot to learn. Um, I'll have to make sure that Phil knows that you've uh, used his pictures and you've uh, credited him. And, and it's been great to see a balanced discussion of, uh, of of all the different approaches. It's really been very enjoyable. Lots of questions coming in. Uh, I'll just start with a, a going for it in the order. So this goes right back to the very start when you were talking about disease etiology. Uh, is it possible for a patient not to have any systemic risk factors or, or smoke, for example, smoking, have great oral hygiene and purely have a hypersensitive host response? Yes, um, and they're the hardest cases to treat and they are the ones, I think, where those other bits of the causal pie are really important. Um, because basically if the strength of the genetic predisposition because the genetic predisposition drives that inflammatory immune response so if you've got a really strong genetic predisposition predisposition to being hyper inflammatory um, and a number of people do then actually you might find that plaque levels of 20 percent are not low enough and that you're still going to get um, bone destruction as a result and, and it's that type of patient You've either got to get them down to 10% or even 5% or you've got to remove one of those other 
um, risk factors, if you like, to try and, and, and get that stability kicking in. Yeah, without doubt, we see that in specialist practice, don't we, in, in hospital yeah. practice all the time, no doubt. Yeah. Um, great question. So this has come from Emma. Uh, her principle is concern moving forwards that, uh, that avoiding treatment of the non-engaged patient crosses the border to supervise neglect. Uh, and could leave them open to a complaint, uh, could even backfire against them. How do you, so how would you respond to that? It's a really good point. And if you look at the restorative commissioning standard that's been published by the NHS England and the OCDO, you'll see there's an entire section in there on non-engaging patients. Um, and actually, as we move forward, we, 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 the BSP are working with the OCDO at the moment to try and actually make the provision of proper perio in the NHS more affordable. In other words, we're trying to actually redirect some of the funding so, so that you can get uh, more Bantu payments to treat the patient properly. The only way we can do that is by shifting things towards the left-hand side of that graph I showed you. Uh, in other words, instead of everybody having the RSD done, there will be patients who don't um, engage and you will need just to submit a plaque score uh, and a bleeding score to show that patient is not engaging. That patient can still remain at step one and you can see them every six months and reinforce the message. But actually you will filter patients out that way from step two. And by, by getting the engaging patients into step two and then increasing remuneration for doing the subgingival work that takes quite a bit of time, that seems a logical way of trying to, to really um, ensure that those engaging patients get a good outcome. The only caveat I'd put on that is the patient may not be engaging because they can't. They might have rheumatoid arthritis and have a physical restriction in engaging, or they might not be engaging because they need professional behaviour change advice and training. And so there's a kind of a referral pathway in there for those types of patients who you think are doing their best, but just not getting there um, for legitimate reasons. And that would be a referral really to a behavior change specialist through that pathway. So it's a, it's a really good question. Um, and um, as long as you've documented your plaque scores, um, you'll be safe in terms of uh, that accusation of supervised neglect. Yeah, I can I just add two points on that. I mean, the the obvious document to refer you to, especially if you're in NHS practice, is the Healthy Gums Do Matter document. It's a uh, an evidence-based pathway it's been medically legally validated it has this engaged and non-engaged approach and that's been running for over five years if you're in nhs practice do have a look at that um it, you can access it via the bsp website uh there's been a huge amount of work i know Ian was involved in the development of that along with shazad uh, yeah. it's really very good and the, the one that that just makes me smile and you you've basically brought the point up I remember being sat in council talk, BSP council talking about this concept of withholding treatment from a non-engaged patient. And Ian Needleman came out with the, the very valid point. What if it's your fault the patient's not engaged? What if you're the barrier? And so yeah. you know, you you've mentioned that there that there's onward referrals, but I know even in our team in practice, if a, if if a message isn't getting through with one clinician, we try them with another clinician and just see if a different approach will work, because sometimes you're the problem, not the patient. Well, actually, and I take, I'll take that stage further. Firstly, i would reinforce what you said about the health gums do matter. And in fact, um, you know, you, you'll see some of the diagrams I've shown you tonight in that because uh, Shazad's done a brilliant job with it. Um, so I, I would, and in fact, the engaging and non-engaging patient um, narrative in that is, is taken from the commissioning standard, but Shazad's tweaked it and done some research on it just to alter the threshold slightly. But um, what I often used to do, I shouldn't admit this really, when I was a registrar at Leeds is uh, uh, there was a group of us and if a patient wasn't listening to us and engaging, we would bring a specialist colleague in who was more senior. It wasn't, it was just one of the other registrars um, and they'd <laughs> listen to that person. And I hear this from hygienists, from my staff hygienists. My staff hygienists made it very clear to me that unless I sit down and have that conversation with a patient, when I refer to the staff hygienist, they don't get the engagement. But if, if I've said it first, and then a second person who's the hygienist comes along and says it, the patient listens because it's come from two different people. It doesn't matter who, who those people are. It's a triangulation of information. It's two people, different people saying the same thing. That's really interesting that you do the same in your practice, Ian. But um, yeah, 
Yeah, they're great. Um, plenty more questions. Um, so would you attempt RSD on patients who are still smoking? As long as they're aware mm. of the reduced treatment outcome? Yeah, I would actually. Um, it, it's one we debated a lot because in the old days, I think ethically and morally you have to because you would be withdrawing treatment uh, or, or you'd be withholding treatment that they need. Um, but I'd only do it obviously if the plaque control is good. You know, if they're making an effort and they, and they are trying to improve their plaque control uh, and they're engaging, then uh, I would simply tell them you ain't going to heal as well. The outcome's not going to be as good. But actually, uh, they will keep their teeth for longer if you do it. So I would in, in that situation. Yeah, I think because there is a gain to be had, even though it's a reduced gain, it, medical legally, it's very difficult to withhold it, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So it's it's, it's inf informed consent. Yeah. Um, oh, interesting co question from Michaela. Uh, do you think it's possible to have bone regeneration or improvements just from step one? I think that's probably relating to your neuroscience patient, uh, neuroscientist. Or yeah, the neurosurgeon, the brain surgeon. Yeah. Um, hi, Michaela. Yes, is the answer to that. I've seen it. Uh, in yeah. fact, this is hard to believe. Now, I wish I wish I'd actually put the X-rays in, but but literally yesterday on my undergraduate clinic, um, a patient came back, and I always get the undergrads. So all they'd had done is they'd had pre-COVID, okay, pre-lockdown, they'd had step one, they'd had the OH, the detailed pocket charting done, etc. And they'd been sent away and they came back um, over a year later to have the RSD done. And I said to the student, can you check uh, that nine millimeter pocket before you start diving in and doing anything? And the student came back, said it's only three millimeters. I said, no, I don't believe you. Um, <laughs> because we looked at the radiographs and the bone loss was two thirds of the way down the route. Um, it was three millimeters and not bleeding. So we re re radiographed the patient and the bone loss was now only um, about 20% of the way down the route. There'd been phenomenal bone regeneration um, mm -hmm. just with step one. I mean, I've never, that's rare, I'll be honest. It's rare that you see that. But it's not yeah. rare that I get a patient referred in who might have waited three months to see us and the GDPs referred them in having done the basic perio treatment saying, can you have a look? Because they had a lot of disease. And there's half the disease when we see them because actually they've had the healing period um, and um, it's much easier for us to manage them at that point. Half the job's been done in practice. Yeah. No, I've, again, we, we see it all the time. There's no no two ways about it. Nick Lewis, who many of you will know, a restorative consultant, was at the Eastman. He shows a great case on an upper central incisor where the patient didn't come back for their treatment for the best part of 10 months. And again, nine becoming a three and, and great bone fill. It, it's, um, yeah, we do see it. We do see it. I've actually um, got the X-ray in front of me, Ian. Oh, go on. Are you going to try and share it? Paper. <laughs> if, can, can you switch my web? Can I switch my webcam on? Um, oh, blimey. We can try. Make sure uh, there's no patient identifiable data there as well. There isn't. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think I can actually switch my webcam I'll on. I'll tell you what. We've got loads of questions to get through, so we'll oh, just right. carry we'll... on. Carry on. <laughs> um, is it essential to record recession as part of your data capture, um, or are we okay doing pockets bleeding and and having our radiographic bone levels? I, I, that's a great question, um, and my answer to that is um, I don't routinely record recession, no, unless it's severe on a particular site or specific teeth, in which case I'll write it in the notes, but I don't chart it in the detail chart and the reason is if I do the non-surgical treatment and we get closed pockets how is it going to affect my treatment it's not going to affect my treatment at all your treatment decision is made on residual pockets not on the amount of recession um, yeah. so the the only caveat to that is if you get a patient stable let's say they've got a I don't know a, a four millimeter pocket and it's stable uh, at four millimeters but they've got a lot of recession on the tooth I would, in that situation, always re-measure the recession because what you could have is recession and attachment loss continuing, but the pocket remains at four millimeters. That's a, a risk. So, so for occasional teeth where you've got significant recession, you might want to keep an eye on those, but your detailed pocket chart with your bleeding scores is really all you have time and, and all you should need to do. Uh, in, and that's just my view. I, I, I don't know if Ian 
if you do don't I, th it. I think that's consistent with the with the BSP guidelines from the the BPE document we talk in there about um we ask you to measure pockets four millimeters or greater when bleeding on probing so that is the medical legal minimum standard isn't it that's the way I would see it funny that yeah funny it's in the BSP document but yes. yeah yeah <laughs> funny that yeah. <laughs> I wonder which clever people wrote that um <laughs> let's move on um would uh, this sort of is this is the same but different but and, it, and it, again i think the bp document answers this would you take six point pocket charts every three months for non-engaging patients um again it's an interesting one isn't it and it, it, it's really hard you're right i think i think that the bsb document does answer it but i'm going to go back to shazad here because i remember on the way home having a chat with shazad in the car uh, when we when he was developing healthy gums do matter and he said yeah but he said it only takes me two minutes to do a detailed pocket chart because I, I i do it the way we discussed i don't bother recording anything unless it's four millimeters or higher um and so it's quite quick to do it uh and i find it as quick to do a detailed pocket chart as it does to do a bpe properly because of course if you do a bpe properly you're supposed to walk the probe around the gingival margin all the way around aren't you um and so it's one of those isn't it where i think if you're really good at detail pocket charts and it takes you literally 90 seconds uh to do it uh, if you're experienced then why wouldn't you but i think the truth of the matter is it's fairly pointless doing a detailed pocket chart on a non-engaging patient after three months uh, i would probably leave it for six or i think we say 12 months don't we and in the uh in, in the guidance yeah, I think we, well i think in the i know in the in the second paragraph on the first page it talks about deviation from the guidelines is acceptable uh, in specific patient situations, such as non-engaging, non-compliant patients, yeah. and so we don't we don't stipulate you have to do pocket charts unless there is that level of engagement. But I think because don't I suppose you and I you know, are always blessed that we always have chair side support for our pocket charts, and I'm sure we've got many hygienists yeah. listening who who are not supported yeah. maybe as they should be with with chair side support. Um, yeah. And so I think I think ultimately we. If you go, if you're going to not do pocket charting, what we've always taught, whenever I mean, I taught this to my undergraduates, and and we teach it still now. If you're not going to do it, tell me why you're not doing it. So have it in your notes why you haven't got that pocket chart. If you've got a BP code for, you know, it's delayed due to poor compliance, poor pack control, and at least you've got a reason why you didn't have that data capture. It's a real barrier, um, the detailed pocket chart. I mean, again, I remember the first meeting I went to, uh, round table meeting with Shazad, and it was the um, um, it, it was the Manchester sort of the Greater Manchester LDN at the time that were debating it all. Um, and a very senior person, the profession, was sat next to me, um, I sh who shall remain nameless, um, because I made the point that I had heard that with the BSP, the first revision of the BP guidelines, where we'd said for baseline code threes, you need to do a baseline detail pocket chart, which is not what it used to say. You only did that after treatment, not as a baseline. You did it as an outcome measure. And we changed it uh, for a period of time that a number of practitioners were specifically intentionally probing lightly to avoid getting a code three because they didn't have time to do the detail pocket chart. This very <laughs> senior very yeah. senior person sat next to me said oh that's what i do i probe particularly gently to avoid a code three because i haven't got time to do the pocket chart and funnily enough within a month the bsp had changed the guidance back to say no no detailed pocket chart for code threes at baseline but please do do it as an outcome measure uh, at the end of treatment so it is a barrier particularly for hygienists who don't have a nurse supporting them but yeah. i've got a nurse who works with me and i don't even need to tell her where i'm starting she says right you're starting just to buckle up left seven yeah. Um, and it's it's rapid you can do it in, in in a minute or two yeah i'm devastated I'm, I'm about to lose my nurse to the hygiene therapy course at sheffield i can't believe they let her in and she's now i'm not oh. going to lose her so i've got to train somebody else up <laughs> oh. she'll be a fantastic uh, therapist i'm sure anyway uh on to the next question this is a this is a question that that you and i have talked about before um in fact, I feel like this whole S3 thing we, you and I have debated at some point over the years. But would you recommend the routine use of LA for every patient for subgingival PMPR? Or does this imply that instrumentation is maybe too vigorous and traumatic? No, it's not too vigorous and traumatic. Um, you know, some patients genuinely uh, are just incredibly sensitive. Um, 
you know, and they jump when you put the probe in there at an incredibly light pressure. And, and for me, it's about the patient being comfortable because I want them to come back. Uh, and I also want to be able to do a thorough job. Um, and, you know, yes, light instrumentation is what we practice. But what you have to appreciate is that not everybody is a fill hour or an Ian Dunn for that matter. Uh, and, and in those situations, uh, they may need to use more pressure. And you know what? It's all right. You still get a good result. You might not get as bone regeneration. It's not ideal, but I'd rather you did that than undertreated, if you like. Um, so there's a balance, and it depends upon experience, I think. Um, some patients don't I need the agree more. individual treatment. You know, everybody's different. Yeah. I, I think I couldn't agree more. It, the answer really is it's not a panacea for every patient. This is something that is, if the, if you can do your job, and they and they, the patient can cope then fine and if you can't then they need it and and that's it and we've always said that on the course of that patients who need it have it and those that don't don't and it's but it's not on every patient um next question so um there's lots of so lots of repetition um okay can i ask in terms of treatment plans um in terms of if you if you're taking a quadrant approach to scaling, they've managed to not not use the word root planing. But if you're doing a quadrant approach, is there a specific time period you should be considering for those appointments? Well, again, it's a good question, and again, it depends upon your experience, and it depends also upon um, the patient and how easy or difficult they are to treat. You know, if they're fidgety and they you know they're moving around all the time then it can take longer. I think you take as long as, as it takes, and it also depends upon the amount of disease you're treating. Absolutely. And if you're treating somebody with, you know, 70, 80% bone loss, you're probably gonna need a good 30 minutes. You might even need 45, <laughs> particularly yeah. around the molars. But if, you, if you're managing somebody with sort of stage one or, or, or even to a degree stage two disease, you're probably not gonna need as long. So I would titrate it according to severity of disease, experience, level, and patient. Okay, yeah, I, again, to, uh, total agreement. Um, is the flowchart available on the BSP website? Uh, can you ask Paula? <laughs> <laughs> I can, I I can answer the question. I can answer the question. It, it's it, no. it, it, it's no. not there yet. It's being tweaked. It will be. It will be available hopefully within within days. Uh, yeah. We're also having. Uh, my understanding is. Sort of, uh, some printed copies and there'll be in in sort of give you a bit of a sneak preview on we've got all sorts of very clever video stuff coming out um that will be available via the qr code on the flow chart that really i don't think anyone will have seen anything quite like it before certainly i've not seen anything like it in dentistry so just watch this space for that it's all everything's happened so quickly uh to get to this point that it we, we would have loved to have had that ready two weeks ago it's just not quite there we, we need it to be right so thanks for asking it will be there and trust me if you follow us on social media you will not miss it it is i think it's on iteration number 105 of them <laughs> i think so i think we've moved at a full stop about 20 times haven't we <laughs> um okay let me we are i'm very conscious that brian from security is going to come in and turn ian's lights off any minute so <laughs> we will have to we will have to limit this to the last couple of questions um let's have a look so there's lots of repetition most of the questions relate to would you do treatment in patients with poor, poor part control and we've already we've covered that 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 is effectively step one and we don't move to step two until the pay, we have an engaging patient it's a yeah. very, very common treatment. Yeah. Uh, so and, and, and hopefully in the next in in, in the next months or so that that will that will be embedded actually within a within NHS protocols. I hope. Um, and and you know it protects the practitioner. I think because a lot of yeah. practitioners think, well, you know, I've still got to do this treatment and give the patient a chance. Well, actually, you're wasting time and money by doing it because it's not going to work unless you've got an engaging patient. And and that's yeah. sort of accepted now. Quick question about just going back to the the data capture. We, we've we've both agreed that we don't record recession uh, with our patients, so bleeding and pocketing. But the question is, do we do we either of us record mobility? 
I record mobility, yeah, I do. Um, just as one, two or three, three generally means it's going in the bucket. Um, <laughs> but I do record mobility, yes. Yeah. And the reason I do it, I, just uh, for information, is because f for me, I, I, there are some patients I treat who've got 90% bone loss, all the teeth are grade two mobile, they're perfectly happy like that for five, 10 years functioning. And there are other patients who have, you know, a grade two mobile tooth and the rest are okay. And it's driving them mad, they can't function on it. it and you end up having to make a treatment decision that is personalized to that patient's uh, and, and how they they feel about the mobility themselves. Yeah, to do, I mean, for me on a very practical level, how, I mean, how many patients do we all see where you, you say to them, you do realize a couple of those teeth are loose and the patients say, are they? And yes. they're blissfully unaware. As you educate a patient with, in terms of periodontal management and they start engaging with their interdental plaque control and they're looking at teeth moving, it can be quite disconcerting. And patients will often come in and, and, and say, oh, my teeth have started to go loose. It's quite nice having that baseline chart to say, well, actually, when we first met, you were here. And actually, as we see treatments improving and outcomes improving, we actually see a reduction in, in mobility sometimes, don't we? So oh, it's quite a, nice thing to, quite a nice thing to record as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, let's have a look. There's a, qu a question about, you know, uh, it's, it's come up three times actually, so I suppose I need to ask it. Um, what is used regarding irrigation to remove endotoxin? Would you suggest or not suggest flushing of pockets with chlorhexidine to remove debris? No, uh, it doesn't work. Um, the paper, it's for we querying and stuff, isn't it? There's no evidence. Well, we also did an RCT back before Mark did it in 1992, published in the JCP, that showed that if you put chlorhexidine through an ultrasonic scaler, uh, there's absolutely no benefit to doing that, uh, you know, other than water. So if you're going to flush out with anything, you may as well flush out with water because the, the, the GCF just washes the chlorhexidine out. It doesn't hang around to do anything. So if you want to flush it out, just flush out with water. Yeah, great. I mean, that, yeah, people ask me, and I always say it's just the ultrasonic that does the flushing. Um, a a nation-specific question. Are the BSP also engaging with NHS Scotland? Because obviously they have the old um, item of service and there is still a scale and polish fee. And it literally, those words are used in, in the um, NHS Scottish remuneration. Oh, yeah. And I can tell you because I've, I've, I had to get the data for some work we're doing for the EFP uh, with The Economist. Uh, I had to get some data from the British Standards Authority um, and so I've got data on band one, band two, and band three payments, specifically in relation to Perio. And actually what they record is scale and polish band one, scale and polish band two, scale and polish band three. I mean, the reason that the term still exists is because it's actually embedded in, uh, in the infrastructure of, of the NHS. And that's yeah. why it needs to be removed at the highest level to get rid of it. Um, in terms of what the Scots are doing, I don't know. Um, I know what NHS England are doing, and I know that Sarah meets with her equivalents in the devolved nations all the time and shares good practice. Uh, they're just a lot more agile in Scotland than we are in England. Everything doesn't have to go through government gateway like it does for yeah. the CDO here, uh, which just takes months and months. It's frustrating. Yeah. I'm probably going to make this the last question because I'm just I am genuinely conscious that Ian could get locked in the building overnight and he has to go home yeah. to to his family. Um, do, with regard to the finding of the non-engaging patients, is this purely based on plaque scores? Um, no. Again, that's a good question. Um, I think what's really important to recognise with plaque scores is that patients brush their teeth before they come into surgery, so you can have a really low plaque score and shed loads of bleeding. So for me, often that sort of marginal bleeding score and the inflammation you see is a better measure of their longer term plaque control um, than actually a plaque score. And that's why in the uh, flow chart and in, and in HGDM as well, we, we look at plaque and bleeding and not just the plaque on its own. Yeah, brilliant. Um... I'm going to, before you all sign off, just ask you to join me in two weeks where I'll have uh, Professor Nikos Donos talking us through step three. So make sure you register for that in advance. Again, this is going to be a very popular, um, popular discussion on the evening. 
I'd like to reiterate our thanks to Action for their support that allowed us to bring this to you free of charge this evening. And then our final thanks goes to uh, Professor Ian Chappell for what's been a really, really enjoyable evening. Uh, very informative. Thanks very much, Ian. My pleasure. Thank you, Ian. And thanks to everybody for taking the time to uh, to join. I'm going to run out That's of the building. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Turn the lights off, everyone. Right. Take care of your seat in two weeks. Bye-bye. Right.